Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future by Father Seraphim Rose. Chapter 2, The Power of the Pagan Gods, The Assault Upon Christianity. Section 2, A War of Dogma. Today, Christianity is taking the thrusts of a foe that is all but invisible to the faithful, and if it can, it will pierce to the heart before declaring its name. The enemy is Hinduism, and the war being waged is a war of dogma. When Vedanta societies were founded in this country around the turn of the century, first efforts were directed to establishing that there was no real difference between Hinduism and Christianity. Not only was there no conflict, but a good Christian would be a better Christian by studying and practicing the Vedanta. He would understand the real Christianity. In early lectures, the Swamis attempted to show that those ideas which seemed peculiar to Christianity, like the Logos and the Cross, really had their origin in India, and those ideas which seemed peculiar to Hinduism, like rebirth, transmigration of the soul, and samadhi, or trance, were also to be found in Christian scripture when it was properly interpreted. This kind of bait caught many sincere but misguided Christians. The early push was against what might be called, quote, sectarian dogmas and for a so-called scientific religion based on a comparative study of all religions. Primary stress was always on this. There is no such thing as difference. All is one. All differences are just on the surface. They are apparent or relative, not real. All this is clear from published lectures that were delivered in the early 1900s. Today, we are in great danger because this effort was so very successful. Now common parlance has, quote, dogma, a derisive term, but this scorn could not have originated with those who know that it refers to the most precious heritage of the church. However, once the bad connotation became fixed, the timid, who never liked to be associated with the unpopular, began to speak of, quote, which is redundant, but bespeaks disapproval. So the attitude was insidiously absorbed from, quote, broad-minded critics who either didn't know that dogma states what Christianity is, or simply didn't like what Christianity is all about. The resulting predisposition of many Christians to back down when faced with the accusation of holding to dogma has given the Hindus no small measure of help and aid from within had strategic advantages. The incredible fact is that few see that the very power that would overturn Christian dogma is itself nothing but an opposing system of dogmas. The two cannot blend or quote, enrich each other because they are wholly antithetical. If Christians are persuaded to throw out, or what is tactically more clever, to alter their dogmas to suit the demand for a more up-to-date or, quote, universal Christianity, they have lost everything, because what is valued by Christians and by Hindus is immediately derived from their dogmas, and Hindu dogmas are a direct repudiation of Christian dogmas. This leads us to a staggering conclusion. What Christians believe to be evil, Hindus believe to be good, and conversely. What Hindus believe to be evil, Christians believe to be good. The real struggle lies in this, that the ultimate sin for the Christian is the ultimate realization of good for the Hindu. On a lower level, it is pride that turns even man's virtues into sins. But for the Hindu in general, and the Advaitin or Vedantin in particular, the only quote sin is not to believe in yourself and in humanity as God himself. 
In the words of Swami Vivekananda, who was the foremost modern advocate of Vedanta, quote, You do not yet understand India. We Indians are man worshippers after all. Our God is man. End quote. The doctrine of mukti, or salvation, consists in this that, quote, man is to become divine by realizing the divine. End quote. From this, one can see the dogmas of Hinduism and Christianity standing face to face, each defying the other on the nature of God, the nature of man, and the purpose of human existence. But when Christians accept the Hindu propaganda that there is no battle going on, that the differences between Christianity and Hinduism are only apparent and not real, then Hindu ideas are free to take over the souls of Christians, winning the battle without a struggle. And the end result of this battle is truly shocking. The corrupting power of Hinduism is immense. In my own case, with all of the basically sound training that I received at the convent, 20 years in Hinduism brought me to the very doors of the love of evil. You see, in India, quote, God is also worshipped as evil, in the form of the goddess Kali. But about this I will speak in the next section, on Hinduism practices. This is the end in store when there is no more Christian dogma. I say this from personal experience, because I have worshipped Kali in India, and if you give up the living God, the throne is not going to remain empty. Chapter 2, Section 3 Hindu Places and Practices In 1956, I did field work with headhunters in the Philippines. My interest was in primitive religion, particularly what is termed an, quote, unacculturated area, where there had been few missionaries. When I arrived in Ifugao, that's the name of the tribe, I didn't believe in black magic. When I left, an Ifugao priest, a Mudbaki, named Talupa, became my best friend and informant. In time, I learned that he was famous for his skill in the black art. He took me to the Baki, which is a ceremony of ritualistic magic that occurred almost every night during the harvest season. A dozen or so priests gathered in a hut, and the night was spent invoking deities and ancestors, drinking rice wine and making sacrifices to the two small images known as Bolol. They were washed in chicken blood, which had been caught in a dish and used to divine the future before it was used on the images. They studied the blood for the size and number of bubbles in it, the time it took to coagulate, also the color and configuration of the chicken's organs gave them information. Each night I dutifully took notes, but this was just the beginning. I won't elaborate on Ifugao magic. Suffice it to say that by the time I left, I had seen such a variety and quantity of supernatural occurrences that any scientific explanation was virtually impossible. If I had been predisposed to believe anything when I arrived, it was that magic had a wholly natural explanation. Also, let me say that I don't frighten very easily. But the fact is that I left Ufugao because I saw that their rituals not only worked, but they had worked on me at least. I say all this so that what I say about Hindu practices and places of worship will not seem incredible, the product of a, quote, heated brain. Eleven years after the Ufugao episode, I made a pilgrimage to the cave of Amarnath, deep in the Himalayas. Hindu tradition has it the most sacred place of Siva worship, the place where he manifests himself to his devotees and grants boons. It is a long and difficult journey over the Bahaguna, a 14,000 foot pass, and across a glacier, so there was plenty of time to worship him mentally on the way. 
essentially since the boy who led the pack pony didn't speak any English and I didn't speak any Hindi. This time I was predisposed to believe that the god whom I had worshipped and meditated on for years would graciously manifest himself to me. The Siva image in the cave is itself a curiosity, an ice image formed by dripping water. It waxes and wanes with the moon. When it is the full moon, the natural image reaches the ceiling of the cave, about 15 feet, and by the dark of the moon, almost nothing of it remains, and so it waxes and wanes each month. To my knowledge, no one has explained this phenomenon. I approached the cave at an auspicious time, when the image had waxed full. I was soon to worship my god with green coconut, incense, red and white pieces of cloth, nuts, raisins, and sugar, all the ritually prescribed items. I entered the cave with tears of devotion. What happened then is hard to describe. The place was vibrant, just like an Ifugao hut with Baki in full swing. Stunned to find it a place of inexplicable wrongness, I left retching before the priest could finish making my offering to the great ice image. The facade of Hinduism had cracked when I entered the Siva cave, but it was still some time before I broke free. During the interim, I searched for something to support the collapsing edifice, but I found nothing. In retrospect, it seems to me that we often know something is really bad long before we can really believe it. This applies to Hindu, quote, spiritual practices quite as much as it does to the so-called, quote, holy places. When a student is initiated by the guru, he is given a Sanskrit mantra, a personal magic formula, and specific religious practices. These are entirely esoteric and exist in the oral tradition. You won't find them in print, and you are very unlikely to learn about them from an initiate because of the strong negative sanctions which are enforced to protect this secrecy. In effect, the guru invites his disciple to prove the philosophy by his own experience. The point is, these practices do in fact work. The student may get powers or, quote, cities. These are things like reading minds, power to heal or destroy, to produce objects, to tell the future, and so on, the whole gamut of deadly psychic parlor tricks. But far worse than this, he invariably falls into a state of prelest, where he takes delusion for reality. He has, quote, spiritual experiences of unbounded sweetness and peace. He has visions of deities and of light. One might recall that Lucifer himself can appear as an angel of light. By, quote, delusion, I don't mean that he really doesn't experience these things. I mean rather that they are not from God. There is, of course, the philosophical construct that supports every experience, so the practices and the philosophy sustain each other and the system becomes very tight. Actually, Hinduism is not so much an intellectual pursuit as a system of practices, and these are quite literally black magic. That is, if you do X, you get Y, a simple contract. But the terms are not spelled out, and rarely does a student ask where the experiences originate or who is extending him credit in the form of powers and, quote, beautiful experiences. It's the classical Faustian situation, but what the practitioner doesn't know is that the price may well be his immortal soul. There's a vast array of practices, practices to suit every temperament. The chosen deity may be with form, a god or goddess, or formless, the absolute Brahman. The relationship to the chosen ideal also varies. It may be that of a child, mother, father, friend, beloved, servant, or, in the case of Advaita Vedanta, the quote, relationship is identity. 
At the time of initiation, the guru gives his disciple a mantra, and this determines the path he will follow and the practices he will take up. The guru also dictates how the disciple will live his everyday life. In the Vedanta, or monistic system, single disciples are not to marry. All their powers are to be directed toward success in the practices. Nor is a sincere disciple a meat eater, because meat blunts the keen edge of perception. The guru is literally regarded as God himself. He is the disciple's redeemer. At base, the many, quote, spiritual exercises derive from only a few root practices. I'll just skim over them. First, there's idolatry. It may be the worship of an image or a picture with offerings of light, camphor, incense, water, and sweets. The image may be fanned with a yak tail, bathed, dressed, and put to bed. This sounds very childish, but it is prudent not to underestimate the psychic experiences which they can elicit. Vedantic idolatry takes the form of self-worship, either mentally or externally, with all the ritualistic props. A common aphoristic saying in India epitomizes this self-worship. It is, so ham, so ham, or, quote, I am he, I am he. Then there's japa, or the repetition of the Sanskrit mantra given to the disciple at his initiation. In effect, it's the chanting of a magic formula. Pranayama consists in breathing exercises used in conjunction with japa. There are other practices which are peculiar to the tantra or worship of God as mother, the female principle, power, energy, the principle of evolution and action. They're referred to as the five M's. They're overtly evil and rather sick-making, so I won't describe them. But they, too, have found their way into this country. Swami Vivekananda prescribed this brand of Hinduism along with the Vedanta. He said, quote, I worship the terrible. It is a mistake to hold that with all men pleasure is the motive. Quite as many are born to seek after pain. Let us worship the terror for its own sake. How few have dared to worship death or Kali. Let us worship death, end quote. Again, the Swami's words on the goddess Kali, quote, There are some who scoff at the existence of Kali, yet today she is out there amongst the people. They are frantic with fear, and the soldiery have been called to deal out death. Who can say that God does not manifest himself as evil as well as good? But only the Hindu dares worship him as the evil, end quote. The great pity is that this one-pointed practice of evil is carried on in the firm conviction that it's good, and the salvation that is vainly sought through arduous self-effort in Hinduism can only be wrought by God through Christian self-effacement. Chapter 2, Section 3, Evangelizing the West. In 1893, an unknown Hindu monk arrived at the Parliament of Religions in Chicago. He was Swami Vivekananda, whom I have mentioned already. He made a stunning impression on those who heard him, both by his appearance, beturbaned and robed in orange and crimson, and by what he said. He was immediately lionized by high society in Boston and New York. Philosophers at Harvard were mightily impressed, and it wasn't long until he had gathered a hard core of disciples who supported him and his grandiose dream, the evangelizing of the Western world by Hinduism, and more particularly, the Vedantic or monistic Hinduism. Vedanta societies were established in the large cities of this country and in Europe, but these centers were only a part of his work. 
more important was introducing Vedantic ideas into the bloodstream of academic thinking. Dissemination was the goal. It mattered little to Vivekananda whether credit was given to Hinduism or not, so long as the message of Vedanta reached everyone. On many occasions he said, knock on every door, tell everyone he is divine. Today, parts of his message are carried in paperbacks that you can find in any bookstore. Books by Aldous Huxley, Christopher Isherwood, Somerset Maugham, Teilhard de Chardin, and even Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton, of course, constitutes a special threat to Christians because he presents himself as a contemplative Christian monk and his work has already affected the vitals of Roman Catholicism, its monasticism. Shortly before his death, Father Merton wrote an appreciative introduction to a new translation of the Bhagavad Gita, which is the spiritual manual or, quote, Bible of all Hindus, and one of the foundation blocks of monism or Advaita Vedanta. The Gita, it must be remembered, opposes almost every important teaching of Christianity. His book on the Zen masters, published posthumously, is also noteworthy, because the entire work is based on a treacherous mistake, the assumption that all so-called, quote, mystical experiences in every religion are true. He should have known better. The warnings against this are loud and clear, both in Holy Scriptures and in the Holy Fathers. Today I know of one Catholic monastery in California where cloistered monks are experimenting with Hindu religious practices. They were trained by an Indian who became a Catholic priest. Unless the ground had been prepared, I think this sort of thing couldn't be happening. But, after all, this was the purpose of Vivekananda's coming to the West, to prepare the ground. Vivekananda's message of Vedanta is simple enough. It looks like more than it is because of its trappings, some dazzling Sanskrit jargon, and a very intricate philosophical structure. The message is essentially this. All religions are true, but Vedanta is the ultimate truth. Differences are only a matter of, quote, levels of truth. In Vivekananda's words, quote, Man is not traveling from error to truth, but climbing up from truth to truth, from truth that is lower to truth that is higher. The matter of today is the spirit of the future, the worm of today, the god of tomorrow. The Vedanta rests on this, that man is God. So it is for man to work out his own salvation. Vivekananda put it this way, quote, Who can help the infinite? Even the hand that comes to you through the darkness will have to be your own, end quote. Vivekananda was canny enough to know that straight Vedanta would be too much for Christians to follow right off the bat. But, quote, levels of truth provided a nice bridge to perfect ecumenism, where there is no conflict because everyone is right. In the Swami's words, quote, if one religion be true, then all the others must also be true. Thus the Hindu faith is yours as much as mine. We Hindus do not merely tolerate, we unite ourselves with every religion, praying in the mosque of the Mohammedan, worshiping before the fire of the Zoroastrian, and kneeling before the cross of the Christian. We know that all religions alike, from the lowest fetishism to the highest absolutism, are but so many attempts of the human soul to grasp and realize the infinite. So we gather all these flowers, and binding them together with the cords of love, make them into a wonderful bouquet of worship." End quote. Still, all religions were only steps to the ultimate religion, which was Advaita Vedanta. He had a special contempt for Christianity, which at best was a, quote, low truth, a dualistic truth. 
In private conversation, he said that only a coward would turn the other cheek. But whatever he said about other religions, he's always returned to the necessity of Advaita Vedanta. Quote, art, science, and religion, end quote, he said, quote, are but three different ways of expressing a single truth. But in order to understand this, we must have the theory of Advaita, end quote. The appeal to today's youth is unmistakable. Vedanta declares the perfect freedom of every soul to be itself. It denies all distinction between sacred and secular. They are only different ways of expressing the single truth. And the sole purpose of religion is to provide for the needs of different temperaments, a god and a practice to suit everyone. In a word, religion is, quote, doing your own thing. All this may sound far-fetched, but Vivekananda did an effective job. Now, I'll show how successful he was in introducing these Hindu ideas into Roman Catholicism, where his successes have been the most. Swami Vivekananda first came to America to represent Hinduism at the 1893 Parliament of Religions. 1968 was the 75th anniversary of this event, and at that time a symposium of religions was held under the auspices of the Vivekananda Vedanta Society of Chicago. Roman Catholicism was represented by a Dominican theologian from DePaul University, Father Robert Campbell. In my own university, surveys taken of Catholic student attitudes show a great swing towards the liberal views within the last five or six years. I know that the great Swami Vivekananda would himself be in favor of most of the trends in the direction of liberal Christianity." End quote. What Father Campbell apparently didn't know was that the modernistic doctrines he described were not Christian at all. They were pure and simple Vedanta. There will be no question of misinterpretation. I shall quote the Father's words on the modernists' interpretation of five issues, just as they appeared in three international journals. The Prabuddha Bharata, published in Calcutta, the Vedanta Kesheri, published in Madras, and Vedanta and the West, published in London. On doctrines, quote, truth is a relative thing. These doctrines and dogmas, i.e. the nature of God, how man should live, and the afterlife, are not fixed things. They change, and we are coming to the point where we deny some things that were formerly affirmed as sacred truths, end quote. On God, quote, Jesus is divine, true, but any one of us can be divine. As a matter of fact, on many points, I think you will find the liberal Christian outlook is moving in the direction of the East in much of its philosophy, both in its concept of an impersonal God and in the concept that we are all divine, end quote. On original sin, quote, this concept is very offensive to liberal Christianity, which holds that man is perfectible by training and proper education, end quote. On the world, quote, the liberal affirms that it can be improved and that we should devote ourselves to building a more humane society instead of pining to go to heaven, end quote. On other religions, quote, the liberal group says, don't worry about the old-fashioned things such as seeking converts, etc., but let us develop better relations with other religions." End quote. So says Father Campbell for the modernistic Catholics. The modernist has been led like a child by the generous offer of higher truth, 
deeper philosophy and greater sublimity, which can be had by merely subordinating the living Christ to modern man. Here, then, we see the spectacular success of Hinduism, or Swami Vivekananda, or the power behind Vivekananda. It's made a clean sweep of Roman Catholicism. Her watchdogs have taken the thief as the friend of the master, and the house is made desolate before their eyes. The thief said, quote, Let us have interfaith understanding, end quote, and he was through the gate. And the expedient was so simple. The Christian Hindus, the Swamis, had only to recite the Vedanta philosophy using Christian terms. But the Hindu Christians, the modernistic Catholics, had to extrapolate their religion to include Hinduism. Then, necessarily, truth became error and error truth. Alas, some would now drag the Orthodox Church into this desolate house. But let the modernists remember the words of Isaiah, quote, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and for sweet bitter. Woe unto him that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Isaiah 5, 20 through 21. Chapter 2, Section 3. The Goal of Hinduism, the Universal Religion. I was amazed to see the inroads that Hinduism had made during my absence from Christianity. It may seem odd that I discovered these changes all at once. This was because my guru held dominion over my every action, and all this time I was, quite literally, quote, cloistered, even in the world. The Swami's severe injunctions kept me from reading any Christian books or speaking. For all their pretentious talk that all religions are true, the Swamis know that Christ is their nemesis. So for 20 years I was totally immersed in the study of Oriental philosophy and in the practice of its disciplines. I was ordered by my guru to get a degree in philosophy and anthropology. But these were only avocations that filled time between the important parts of my life. Time with Swami and time with the teachings and practices of Vedanta. Swami Vivekananda's mission has been fulfilled in many particulars, but one piece is yet to be accomplished. This is the establishing of a universal religion. In this rests the ultimate victory of the devil, because the universal religion may not contain any, quote, individualistic, sectarian ideas. It will have nothing in common with Christianity except in its semantics. The world and the flesh may be fires in the stove and the chimney, but the universal religion will be a total conflagration of Christianity. The point of all this is that the Jesuit priest Teilhard de Chardin has already laid the foundation for a quote, new Christianity, and it is precisely to Swami Vivekananda's specification for this universal religion. Teilhard de Chardin is an anomaly because, unlike traditional Roman theologians, he is highly appreciated by scholarly clergy who, in charity, I believe don't have any idea what he is talking about. Because Teilhard's ideas are to a great extent plagiarisms from Vedanta and Tantra gummed together with Christian-sounding jargon, and heavily painted with evolutionism. Let me quote one example from him. Quote, the world I live in becomes divine, yet these flames do not consume me, nor do these waters dissolve me. For, unlike the false forms of monism that impel us through passivity towards unconsciousness, the pan-Christianism I am finding places union at the term of an arduous process of differentiation. I shall attain the spirit only by releasing completely and exhaustively all the powers of matter. I recognize that, 
following the example of the incarnate God, revealed to me by the Catholic faith, I can be saved only by becoming one with the universe." End quote. This is outright Hinduism. It has a little bit of everything in it. A recognizable verse from an Upanishad, and pieces from several of the philosophical systems along with their practices. In a press conference given by Father Arupe, General of the Society of Jesus, in June of 1965, Teilhard de Chardin was defended on the grounds that, quote, he was not a professional theologian and philosopher, so that it was possible for him to be unaware of all the philosophical and theological implications attached to some of his intuitions, end quote. Then Father Arupe praised him, quote, Pere Telhard is one of the great masters of contemporary thought, and his success is not to be wondered at. He carried through, in fact, a great attempt to reconcile the world of science with the world of faith, end quote. The upshot of this reconciliation is a new religion, and in Teilhard's words, quote, the new religion will be exactly the same as our old Christianity, but with a new life drawn from the legitimate evolution of its dogmas as they come in contact with new ideas." End quote. With this bit of background, let us look at Vivekananda's universal religion and Teilhard's quote, new Christianity. Second, its foundation is evolution. In Teilhard's words, quote, a hitherto unknown form of religion, one that no one could yet have imagined or described, for a lack of a universal large enough and organic enough to contain it, is burgeoning in men's hearts from a seed sown by the idea of evolution." End quote. And again, quote, "...original sin binds us hand and foot and drains the blood from us." End quote because, quote, as it is now expressed, it represents a survival of static concepts that are an anachronism in our evolutionist system of thought, end quote. Such a pseudo-religious concept of, quote, evolution, which was consciously rejected by Christian thought, has been basic to Hindu thought for millennia. Every Hindu religious practice assumes it. Third, the universal religion will not be built around any particular personality, but will be founded on, quote, eternal principles. Teilhard is well on his way towards the impersonal God when he writes, quote, Christ is becoming more and more indispensable to me, but at the same time the figure of the historical Christ is becoming less and less substantial and distinct to me. Quote, my view of him is continually carrying me further and further along the axis of, I hope, orthodoxy." End quote. Sad to say, this non-historical, quote, Christ, spirit is Hindu orthodoxy, not Christian. Fourth, the main purpose of the universal religion will be to satisfy the spiritual needs of men and women of diverse types individualistic, sectarian religions cannot offer this. Teilhard believed that Christianity did not fit everybody's religious aspirations. He records his discontent in these words, quote, Christianity is still to some extent a refuge, but it does not embrace, or satisfy, or even lead the, quote, modern soul any longer, end quote. Fifth and final, within the universal religion, or new Christianity, we are all wending our way to the same destination. For Teilhard de Chardin, it is the omega point, which belongs to something that is beyond representation. For Vivekananda, it is the om, the sacred syllable of the Hindus, quote, all humanity converging at the foot of that sacred place where is set the symbol that is no symbol, the name that is beyond all sound." End quote. Where will it end? 
this deformation of Christianity and triumph of Hinduism, will we have the Om or will we have the Omega? A Fakir's quote, Miracle and the Prayer of Jesus by Archimandrite Nicholas Drabyazgin. The author of this testimony, a new martyr of the communist yoke, enjoyed a brilliant worldly career as a naval commander, being also deeply involved in occultism as editor of the occult journal Rebus, being saved from almost certain death at sea by a miracle of Saint Seraphim, he made a pilgrimage to Sarav and then renounced his worldly career and occult ties to become a monk. After being ordained priest, he served as a missionary in China, India, and Tibet, as the priest of various embassy churches, and as abbot of several. After 1914, he lived at the Kiev Caves Lavra, where he discoursed to the young people who visited him concerning the influence of occultism on contemporary events in Russia. In the autumn of 1924, one month after he had been visited by a certain Taholks, the author of the book Black Magic, he was murdered in his cell, quote, by persons unknown, with obvious Bolshevik connivance, stabbed by a dagger with a special handle apparently of occult significance. The incident here described, revealing the nature of one of the mediumistic, quote, gifts, which are common in Eastern religions, took place not long before 1900, and was recorded about 1922 by Dr. A. P. Pimofaevich, lately of Novo Divyevo Convent, New York. Russian Text in Orthodox Life, 1956, issue number one. On a wondrous early tropical morning, our ship was cleaving the waters of the Indian Ocean, nearing the island of Ceylon. The lively faces of the passengers, for the most part Englishmen with their families, who were traveling to their posts or on business in their Indian colony, looked avidly in the distance, seeking out with their eyes the enchanted isle, which for practically all of them had been bound up since childhood with so much that was interesting and mysterious in the tales and descriptions of travelers. The island was still scarcely visible when already a fine, intoxicating fragrance from the trees growing on it more and more enveloped the ship with each passing breeze. Finally, a kind of blue cloud lay on the horizon, ever increasing in size as the ship speedily approached. Already one could notice the buildings spread out along the shore, buried in the verdure of majestic palms, and the many-colored crowd of the local inhabitants who were awaiting the ship's arrival. The passengers, who had quickly become acquainted with each other on the trip, were laughing and conversing animatedly with each other on the deck, admiring the wondrous scene of the fairy tale isle as it unfolded before their eyes. The ship swung slowly around, preparing to moor at the dock of the port city of Colombo. Here the ship stopped to take on coal, and the passengers had sufficient time to go ashore. The day was so hot that many passengers decided not to leave the ship until evening, when a pleasant coolness replaced the heat of the day. A small group of eight people, to which I joined myself, was led by Colonel Elliot, who had been in Colombo before and knew the city and its environs as well. He made an alluring proposition. Quote, Ladies and gentlemen, wouldn't you like to go a few miles out of town and pay a visit to one of the local magician fakirs? Perhaps we shall see something interesting." End quote. All accepted the colonel's proposition with enthusiasm. It was already evening when we left behind the noisy streets of the city and rolled along a marvelous jungle road which was twinkling with the sparks of millions of fireflies. Finally, the road suddenly widened, and in front of us there was a small clearing surrounded on all sides by jungle. 
At the edge of the clearing under a big tree, there was a kind of hut, next to which a small bonfire was smoldering, and a thin, emaciated old man with a turban on his head sat cross-legged and with his unmoving gaze directed at the fire. Despite our noisy arrival, the old man continued to sit completely immovable, not paying us the slightest attention. Somewhere from out of the darkness, a youth appeared and, going up to the colonel, quietly asked him something. In a short while, he brought out several stools and our group arranged itself in a semicircle not far from the bonfire. A light and fragrant smoke arose. The old man sat in the same pose, apparently noticing no one and nothing. The half moon which arose dispelled to some extent the darkness of the night, and in its ghostly light all objects took on fantastic outlines. Involuntarily, everyone became quiet and awaited to see what would happen. Look, look there on the tree, Miss Mary cried in an excited whisper. We all turned our heads in the direction indicated, and indeed, the whole surface of the immense crown of the tree under which the fakir was sitting was, as it were, gently flowing in the soft illumination of the moon, and the tree itself began gradually to melt and lose its contours. Literally, some unseen hand had thrown over it an airy covering which had become more and more concentrated with every moment. Soon, the undulating surface of the sea presented itself with complete clarity before our astonished gaze. With a light rumble, one wave followed another, making foaming white caps. Light clouds were floating in a sky which had become blue. Stunned, we could not tear ourselves away from this striking picture. And then in the distance there appeared a white ship. Thick smoke poured out of its two large smokestacks. It quickly approached us, cleaving the water. To our great amazement, we recognized it as our own ship, the one on which we had come to Colombo. A whisper passed through our ranks when we read on the stern, traced out in gold letters, the name of our ship, Luisa. But what astounded us most of all was what we saw on the ship, ourselves. Don't forget that at the time when all this happened, cinematography hadn't even been thought of, and it was impossible even to conceive of something like this. Each of us saw ourselves on the ship's deck amongst people who were laughing and talking to each other. But what was especially astonishing, I saw not only myself, but at the same time the whole deck of the ship down to the smallest details, as if in a bird's eye view which of course simply could not be in actuality. At one and the same time, I saw myself among the passengers and the sailors working at the other end of the ship and the captain in his cabin and even our monkey, Melly, a favorite of all, eating bananas on the main mast. All my companions at the same time, each in his own way, were greatly excited at what they were seeing expressing their emotions with soft cries and excited whispers. I had completely forgotten that I was a priest monk and, it would seem, had no business at all participating in such a spectacle. The spell was so powerful that both the mind and the heart were silent. My heart began to beat painfully in alarm. Suddenly I was beside myself. A fear took hold of my whole being. My lips began to move and say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Immediately I felt relieved. It was just as if some mysterious chains which had bound me began to fall away. The prayer became more concentrated, and with it my peace of soul returned. I continued to look at the tree, and suddenly, as if pursued by the wind, the picture became clouded and was dispersed. I saw nothing more except the big tree, illuminated by the light of the moon, 
and likewise the fakir sitting in silence by the bonfire, while my companions continued to express what they were experiencing while gazing at the picture, which for them had not been broken off. But then something apparently happened to the fakir also. He reeled to the side. The youth ran up to him in alarm. The seance was suddenly broken up. Deeply moved by everything they had experienced, the spectators stood up animatedly, sharing their impressions and not understanding at all why the whole thing had been cut off so sharply and unexpectedly. The youth explained it as owing to the exhaustion of the fakir, who was sitting as before, his head down, and paying not the slightest attention to those present. Having generously rewarded the fakir through the youth for the opportunity to be participants of an astonishing spectacle, our group quickly got together for the trip back. While starting out, I involuntarily turned back once more in order to imprint in my memory the whole scene, and suddenly, I shuddered from an unpleasant feeling. My gaze met the gaze of the fakir, which was full of hatred. It was but for a single instant, and then he again assumed his habitual position. But this glance once and for all opened my eyes to the realization of whose power it was that had produced this, quote, miracle. Eastern, quote, spirituality is by no means limited to such mediumistic, quote, tricks as this fakir practiced. We shall see some of its more sincere aspects in the next chapter. Still, all the power that is given to the practitioners of Eastern religions comes from the same phenomenon of mediumism, whose central characteristic is a passiveness before, quote, spiritual reality that enables one to enter into contact with the, quote, gods of the non-Christian religions. This phenomenon may be seen in Eastern meditation, even when it may be given the name of, quote, Christian, and perhaps even in those strange, quote, gifts, which in our days of spiritual decline are mislabeled, quote, charismatic. This concludes part three of Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future by Father Seraphim Rose. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you, and God bless.